I'd like to get us started. Uh, I'm Ned Kalange. I'm president and CEO of the Colorado Trust. And I'm really pleased that you're here this morning to help us kick off the 2014 Health Equity Learning Series. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I, I want to talk about a few things. Uh, first of all is to tell you the purpose of the Health Equity Series. We created this to raise awareness and understanding about health equity issues across Colorado. The Trust believes that all Coloradans should have fair and equal opportunities to lead healthy, productive lives, regardless of race, ethnicity, income, or where we live. And we think that this learning series helps us raise awareness and develop partners uh, in that activity. Partnering with communities, we know we can advance opportunities for all Coloradans to be healthy. So I want to point out a few of the things that are, uh, are at your, your tables today. We provided you with a copy of a new trust publication dedicated to last year's Health Equity Learning Series. It was written by Sherry Walker and summarizes the presentations and stories from those Coloradans impacted by health equity issues. Also, there's a survey. You know, there is no such thing as a free lunch. So we hope you will fill out the survey, share your thoughts about today's event so that um, we can uh, make things better as we move forward. Um, so <clears throat> uh, I hope you uh, will work on those. And I'm actually missing, oh, double-sided. There's a short summary of Policy Link's All In Nation report. There are the discu discussion questions that we hope you'll either uh, think about today or take back to your uh, areas to talk about health equity in your, in your own uh, settings. Um, we can also find all of these resources as well as all of the events from last year that you can watch videos of our previous speakers at our website at coloradotrust.org. I also want to take a chance and welcome our virtual participants. We are live streaming this event with assistance from the Open Media Foundation. Hundreds of people are joining us online, and these 16 Colorado communities are hosting their own viewing parties. So we're trying to uh, make this not just be a metrocentric event, but something we share statewide. So I want to add my welcome to all of those who are joining us from across the state. I want to recognize a few people that I hope will be here if they're not here yet. I haven't seen everyone on my list, but our trust uh, board members include Jennifer Paquette and Reverend R.J. Ross. And we have signed up to have some state legislators join us, Brittany Peterson and Senator uh, uh, Jeannie Nicholson. And if I've missed anyone, uh, I'll make sure I notice you uh, later. And thanks for being here. Following the presentation, we'll engage in a dialogue with the audience. For those who are streaming the presentation, please submit your questions via Twitter. Follow the Colorado Trust and use the hashtag HealthEquityTCT. If you prefer, you can email questions to healthequity at coloradotrust.org. It's our intent to do our best to answer all questions we can today, whether you're in the room or streaming. So without further ado, I want to introduce today's speaker, Mildred Thompson, who's the director of the Policy Link Center for Health and Place. With a background in nursing, Ms. Thompson works in partnership with a broad range of groups to advance new policies and approaches to improve health in low-income communities and communities of color. I really appreciate the fact that um, I've gotten to know <laughs> Mildred from the uh, IOM Roundtable on uh, the promotion of health equity and the elimination of health disparity. She's a good partner, a very uh, astute thinker, and she has that one uh, uh, quality that we all aspire to in the room, that of wisdom. So with that, Mildred, if you could come up, that'd be great. Thank you so much for those kind words. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to join you here today, and I just really want to begin by um, expressing gratitude for the opportunity to join you as you have this important conversation about health equity. And really, I applaud the Colorado Trust for being willing 
to tackle this issue because it's really important and not very many people want to take it as head on as you all are doing. So I appreciate the opportunity. What I'm going to be focusing on today is sharing with you some of the work that we've been doing at PolicyLink in addressing issues of equity. Um, basically, our overall organization is focused on this issue of equity. I am the director for the health equity um, center so that I am going to be talking mostly about our health work. But if you want to know more about the other work that we do at Paulsink, you can go to our website, which will be listed at the end. I'm going to be focusing on um, America's Tomorrow, basically sharing with you research that we have underway and showing how America is changing in terms of its demographic patterns. And then what does that mean? What does it mean about the work that we're doing? What does it mean in terms of our being willing and, and prepared to address these issues as they're emerging? And why we must care, why we must care about this and what we can do in terms of addressing solutions. So um, with that, I'm gonna be talking about how we define health as broader than just absence of disease and illness. That health is an overall state of well-being. That it has to do with one's ability to have physical health, of course, but economic health, social health, and spiritual well-being. Um, again, policy link, this is just a little bit about who we are. We have four offices. Um, our headquarters is in Oakland, California. We have offices in New York, which is primarily communications. We have an office in Los Angeles and in Washington, D.C. So with that, let's get into understanding how the face of America is changing. What I'm going to be showing you are maps, um, and I want you to pay attention to the, the orange and the red, basically showing how the country is changing from, from this is going to be projecting from 1980 to what we project for 1990. Um, 2020, 20, well, for 2040. So as you see, 1980, we had the country, and you pay attention to the geographic areas where these changes are occurring, where you have people of color that are beginning to beginning to merge and to migrate into these areas. 2000, we're beginning to see more across the country. 2010, it was increasing further. This is what we project for 2020. Let me just pause and say, this is research that we're engaged with, uh, with a researcher economist at the University of Southern California, Manuel Pastor. And we've been doing this work with, this, um, with him for a number of years. And we also have been working with um, the, the groups that's been doing the projections. If you want to know more about that, I can talk with you more in the Q&A session. But just seeing in terms of what we're projecting by 2013, how the country is going to be shifting by 2040, you're beginning to see how we are beginning to change our culture and our complexion. I should pause and also let you know that there are four states currently where there is already majority people of color. And that is California, Texas, New Mexico, and Hawaii, where we already have the majority of the people who live there are people of color. So what does this mean for us in terms of how we're looking at the country? As we look at who are the populations that are growing, we're going to talk about the ethnic populations, but first looking in terms of ages. Ages 65 and older, you see less of people of color. It's mostly non-Hispanic whites. And as we look at children who are zero to four, that's where the population growth is occurring more rapidly. So we're seeing children, so women of childbearing age or people who are, who are beginning to migrate and have more children, so the children are the ones who are going to be much more people of color in, a, in, a, in, a, in the immediate future. So what does it mean in terms of our country? Well, what, basically one of the first things that we can say is that it's not the children who are voting, right? It's the people who are 65 and older who tend to be advocates and tend to be voting. So they're the ones who primarily help to shape America's policies and the agenda. And so we want to make sure that that population views children of color as still being their children to the same degree that they were the ones who really helped to support Head Start as a, as a viable um, a program that really makes a difference. Will they begin to see immigrant children and children of color who live here as still embracing them as being our children that we should all care about? Or will, will there be this more divisiveness? Now I want to talk a little about, a little about your, your state. You know, we, we just had our 
researcher just do a little preliminary look at some of the data to see how your state is shifting and to help you understand what does it mean for Colorado. So what you can, be, what you can see here is how the, the shift has occurred in Colorado that is quickly becoming more racially and ethnically diverse as well. And so as you can see in 1980, you had a largely, you know, um, a much larger population of, of whites, and you see that that population is beginning to decrease, and as we project, it's going to decrease even further. So you, we, we want to take a look at, well, how are we looking at who's coming in and what does it mean for us? And so let's look into the actual areas. Now, I don't really know Colorado that well, but it's really clear to see how compared to the United States and where it's changing, looking at your state. So in 1980, this is people of color. And again, as we're looking at 1990, how it's shifting, 2000, something is happening up there in that area that wasn't happening before. I don't know that area, but those who are from there should pay attention to it. Um, and looking at 2010, it's, it's broadening a bit more. Projections for 2020, projections for 2030, and projections for 2040. So how do, we, how do we look at that, embrace it? How do we make sure that the work that we're doing is gonna be meeting the needs of the populations in these places where that shift is occurring? And then my other question is, what's happening in those areas where it's not changing? I don't know. Um, maybe th those are things that you all could discuss further among yourselves about what does this mean for our state? And then we wanted to take a look at some of the other indicators in Colorado to see how they compare to the United States as a whole. So basically what we're saying here is that the highest um, growth rates are occurring in Colorado as a whole among Asians and Latino populations. So there's growth occurring in other ones, but you can see where that's where the majority of the growth is occurring. Taking a look at high school graduation rates, you know, there are a few things that we look at to, uh, to determine and to assess the health of a place. And graduation rates is surely one of those. So if you want to know why we're choosing certain of these, it's because it's an indication of overall health. So again, when you take a look at, um, at, the, at the high school graduation rates, you see the largest population, Asians tend to be right um, and right below Asians or whites, and you have Latinos, Native Americans who are faring a little bit worse. What is also interesting in this next one is looking at median household income in Colorado to see how it compares. Clearly, Colorado's, um, you all are, have a higher income than the general population of America as a whole, with Denver being higher than the state as a whole. So let's take a look at unemployment rates, another indicator. So then who are the, how is Colorado as a, as a whole doing in terms of unemployment rates? With America's rate as a whole, 6.7, you have a much lower rate in your state. So this is looking like you have some good outcomes around graduations, around unemployment. Uh, let's take a look at how we look at that unemployment rate by race and ethnicity. So when you take a look at this, however, and you go a little bit deeper, you're seeing how Native Americans and Alaska Natives tend to have higher unemployment rates. Second highest is African Americans, and then you have Latinos. So we still need to make some changes in addressing some of those disparities. And then this is one that's dear to my heart because I've been working for years around childhood obesity. And so looking to see how you all are doing as a state related to America's obesity rate as a whole. So again, you see where we're talking about people of color who are tending to have these higher than average rates. Now we did have some encouraging news. I got a report last night from um, the CDC had a study published in Journal American Medical Association that's shown that childhood obesity rates are dropping finally in a significant way that we've been waiting for this to happen for, an, for quite a long time. So in 20, 20, uh, 2003 to 2004, the country's childhood obesity rates was 14%. 2011, 2012, it's dropped to 
So we're really pleased and we want to make sure that whatever we're doing to make that change happen, we can continue to do that. But we also have to make sure that we don't get just be so happy that these rates are addressed, are being declining, unless we also make sure that it's addressing those populations who are already suffering the highest disproportionate rate. So, um, so that's enough in terms of your state. What we want to we, we want to share with you a study that we were engaged in with the All In Nation, that is a partnership with the Center for American Progress. And when we did this demographic study, we wanted to see well how are um, how would Americans respond to this idea about the shifting demographics. So we were in, we were in part of a survey in which we interviewed a number of households across America to see how how much they welcomed. And what was really nice to see is that the majority of Americans responded positively to the shifting demographics. It's only a small pocket in the South where they were more concerned, where there were people who were more concerned than those who were hopeful. And even when we asked those who were really concerned, well, what were your major concerns? They had legitimate concerns. One, what does it mean in terms of jobs? Are these people going to come in and take my jobs? That's a fear that people have had for a long time. The other fear was very striking. They were asking, well, what does this mean for our America? Is our America shifting? Do I still define America in the same way that I used to in the past? So that's the question that we all have to answer. How do we look at this and see, do we view it as a positive, that we, we, do we view diversity as a positive thing, or do we view diversity as something that we have to be afraid of or fearful? To what degree do we embrace it? To what degree do we make sure that our programs are meeting the needs in terms of the culture, the language, the way in which we do our work, the way in which we teach? Uh, we are really addressing what needs to be done in order to make sure that those who are coming here really are coming with a sense of welcoming in the way that our country was initially built and created. The other thing that we also were asking in this survey was to what degree did people really welcome an equity-focused agenda? So once we see that the change is occurring, Will there be support? And we were pleased to see 71% of people that we interviewed said that they support the idea of us having an equity-focused agenda. Now, it became a little bit interesting when we talked about, well, are you going to be willing to pay more taxes? Well, that wasn't quite as welcoming <laughs> as, you know, what do we need to do about it? But the fact that something should be done about it was really important that people would see. And this was significant because we don't usually hear this in the media. You know, this is sort of contrary to what we hear in the media. I think the media in general don't tend to portray these changes as being welcoming. I think that we have to be careful about how we tell our stories and the messages that we have about our work. Okay, so why equity? Why now? Why do we need to focus on this and what do we need to do about it? The reason why we need to focus on it is because what this means is that as a group, as a whole, America is really falling behind in a number of areas. And so if we look at the fact that, remember, we've got that large population of children that's beginning to be our growing population, how are they doing in terms of education? They're not, we're not, we're really not competing in the way that we should as a, as a society. And then when we take a look at, well, what, does, what is gonna be required as we move forward with the new growth in new areas around how the country's job market is faring. What we were interest, what was interesting to see is that currently 47% of all jobs require at least an associate degree. Yet sadly, only 27% of African Americans and 26% of US, US born Latinos and 14% of Immigrant born of immigrant uh, Latinos reach that level of competency in terms of the educational requirements. So, what does this mean in terms of their being prepared for the jobs of the future? And then, what are the jobs of the future? The jobs of the future tend to be these jobs around the STEM sciences, healthcare, healthcare support, and community services as we did further research around what are the marketable skills that's needed currently to compete, not only in this country, but globally, because we're part of a global society, it's less about the jobs that involves physical labor. And it's more about the jobs that involve critical thinking, analytical skills, leadership, communication, 
and active listening. Gee, that's very interesting. How are we preparing our children to be able to be competitive in this new environment that we're going to be quick, quickly involved in? The other thing that we were looking at is to what degree, what is our state of health? Um, and I'm going to be sharing a number of slides that were prepared by the Robert Wood Johnson Commission for a Healthy America because Angela Glover of Blackwell, who really regrets that she couldn't be with you today, she really was torn between the demands of what was emerging as a priority for the organization and her really commitment to want to be here. So she's a member of this commission, and so I wanted to share some of the slides that they're just recently releasing about their report, which you really should research and get a copy of that full report. It's really a very juicy, full of material in there. But basically saying the amount of money that we're spending on healthcare is not beginning to change the degree in which our kids and our Americans are still much living, uh, much sicker and living shorter lives than those in other countries. And that we all, you know, and within this country, you look at nearly a fifth of all Americans live in communities that are not healthy. And those are communities with limited jobs, with very poor housing, that don't have access to healthy food, that don't have access for physical activities. Those are not health promoting kind of activities. So we need to make some changes in those areas. Also looking at how our country is faring in terms of poverty. That currently, we, you know, we did a report not too long ago which, which stated that 42% of children who were born in poverty tend to remain in poverty. Now, what do we need to do to change the poverty statistics so that again, that population that's growing will able to be competitive? The, uh, so this gets to this piece around income inequality. And we've been hearing a lot about this. We heard uh, President Obama mention it in his State of the Union address. It's been an issue that's been de near to, and dear to our hearts for a period of time of understanding that who are the people that's really making money in this country? We hear about the 99% and the 1% all the time, but when we research it, we realize that this stuff is really true. That you know, when we take a look at you know, the rise in top 1%, of places, you know, people are earning much more money. As you earn more money, the middle, the middle class is declining. And one thing that we know for sure in order to have a, a thriving economy, we've got to build a middle class. We've got to figure out how to shift this statistic in our country that we deserve to have a little bit more than what's represented now. Because income inequality results in a lot of things that's really not good for the country. It contributes to concentrated poverty where people can live. It contributes to a lot of inadequate education where people can get educated. Basically, income inequality hinders growth. And what we're talking about now is the need for finding new ways and new ways of equitable growth patterns for this country to be viable. And where do we stand in this country in terms of life expectancy? In 1980, America was 15th among, the, among countries in terms of life expectancy, we dropped, we lost ground. By 2009, we were number 27. So, you know, places like Iceland and Sweden and France and Norway and Canada, they all have much better life expectancy than we have in this country. So when people often ask me, what is this about your job, about Center for Health in Place? What is this about place? This is what we got to figure out, what is happening in places that's contributing to people being unhealthy and living in some of our communities. We've got to be willing to explore what does this mean. And what does this mean in terms of looking at the trajectory of over the life course of a child? A child, again, we've talked about those who are born in poverty and stay in poverty. Those children whose families have more wealth tend to do much better. That family income is a predictor of a child's future. And we're not saying that every child who's born in poverty can't do well, clearly people can rise above, but we're talking about the majority of people who have limited access, not about their inabilities, it's about what do they have access to. And all of those things shape a child's sense of health and well-being. So clearly, bottom line, the more education, the longer your life. The more education, the healthier your life will be. The higher income, the better opportunities you have available. 
a higher income, you tend to have healthier children. So, you know, I don't want to keep making this case. I think you're getting this, you know. Um, th this one was interesting. I, I included this one because this was showing how women who are college educated tend to have added years of life than, than men who are, who are college educated. So that was just quite interesting to see how, you know, women who tend to have uh, more education live 25 years older, so that you, you see that 80, you know, you have a much higher percentage of viability, the higher your education. That's basically what the whole gist of that slide is about. And that um, when you look at income linked with racial groups, it, this is not surprising to see when we're looking at those who are uh, above the poverty level, we're looking at people of color. And so it's African Americans and Latinos who tend to not be doing well. So I'm going to be moving past the doom and gloom really soon. This is the last slide. So, but I want to be able to show you what are the factors that contribute to these things. It's not about me painting a picture that's just a dismal picture. I am going to be talking about solutions in the next set. But I wanted to take a moment to say, what is it about communities when we talk about the sense of place? So we have a coin, the term called Communities of Opportunities at PolicyLink. These are communities that have thriving grocery stores, as opposed to low-income communities that tend to have fast food restaurants and mom-and-pop stores. These are places that tend to have really high-performing schools with AP courses. Other communities, don't, some, some communities don't even offer AP courses to kids, and so they get to college and they're really not as prepared as they could have been, not because they, they're not smart, because they didn't have the opportunity. These are places that have good transportation systems in these communities of opportunity. The other ones tend not to have bus stops that are frequent or they, have, they close the bus stops after a certain period of time. The communities of opportunity tend to have thriving banks as opposed to check cash in places with predatory lending. So we, all of those things impact a person's health outcomes. Regardless of what their genetic makeup is, if you're in a community that's not health promoting, your chances of being healthy is going to just be much harder. So then what do we need to do? Solutions. Finally, yes, there are some things that are working. It is not a dismal picture. There are some exciting things that are underway across the country and right here in Colorado that we see as models that we need to begin to learn more about them, to dissect what are the ingredients of success, which I'm going to be talking about a little bit later, and how do we begin to replicate some of these models. So basically, building a healthy community means a few things, and these are just a few simple ones. How do we fully implement Affordable Care Act so people who were not eligible to receive care in the past can now get that care? How do we look at prevention as a way of doing work and not just treating an illness after it's been already in place? How do we look at advancing equity in all of our policies? So there's an, a concept about health in all policies, and we take it a step forward and say equity in all policies. And there are some ways that you can measure that. When you're creating a new program or a new policy, you can ask a few questions. Who's benefiting from this program? Who pays and who decides? Those three questions could help you to understand the equity component in that kind of a new policy. We need to improve access to healthy foods and environments. All of those are things that we know very well. So when we talk about this all-in nation, an all-in nation is one that is forward-looking about its demography. It takes, be willing to take a look at it and to dissect it and to figure out what do we need to do differently. It's one that promotes growth-enhancing approaches. How do we make sure that we are building new businesses, that we're really trying to develop entrepreneurships, that we're creating jobs of the future? And we have to, bottom line, realize to have an all-in nation, we have to be all in this together. So this is too busy. I just wanted to include it because it's, one of, it's basically the RWJF commission slides. And I believe that you all will probably get copies of these slides or have access to them so that you can get a little bit more information about what is being required. But basically what they're saying are three things in order to change the policy agenda. Invest in children, revitalize communities, and to be more health focused in our efforts around doing this work. That in order to achieve these strategies, we have to look at some major ways in which how we're doing our work. 
that we've got to begin to take a look at who needs to be a part of the decision making about new programs and new practices and new policies. It can't be the usual stakeholders. We've got to focus on community engagement. We've got to make sure that we're engaging people who live in communities, those who are doing this work for that they're a part of the solutions. That that's, that's a very easy concept to say, but it's a very difficult one to put in place. It's rare for somebody to say that they don't believe in community engagement, but they just don't quite know how to do it. And this is an area of work that we've been gaining a lot of expertise in um, a number of years. I, in fact, I was brought on to Policy Link 14 years ago as a one-year policy fellow to study this piece around community engagement. And I wrote part of a, I was part of an author of a report by a researcher at UC Berkeley, Meredith Minkler, on, on understanding what is the value of community engagement? Does it really make a difference in programs and practices? And that research demonstrated that community engagement made a major difference in how programs are being developed and how they are run. And that there are some basic principles around community engagement that must be in place. We've got to be willing to look at how we build trusting relationships, how we are engaging people, basically how we're sharing power and leadership, being willing to engage people. You have to slow the process down to involve community members. It takes longer. It takes longer, but you get longer term results. And then I wanted to I create I created this slide to basically show that when we talk about community engagement, it is, it, everything isn't equal. So this thing about ascending impact and descending impact, and my, this is just my belief. My belief is that you get much better engagement and success when you have community engaged at a governance level. That's your top level. That, you, that your least level of, of engagement is town hall meetings where you bring people together once a year, you share your theories, you give them a nice meal, you provide child care, you tell them what you want to do, and then you send them home. That's really not real community engagement. We're talking about substantive engagement where people have voice, they can vote, they have a role to play. So we have to figure out how to really shift this in a different way. And that all of these things along the way, also, they all have value, but we're talking about the greatest value and the greatest impact. And so people have probably heard of health impact assessments. This is something that is in place. It's a, it, it's a set of policies where you make sure that before you do something to a community, you assess the impact of it. So before you put in a new housing development, to what degree will people who live there before, will they be able to come back into the housing envi environment? When you put in a, a, a new development and it requires a lot of parking, how that congestion is going to impact the community. When you put in a new rail system, will you make sure that it's going to be addressing the needs of people? To what degree does dismantling of community infrastructure affect the health of the community residents? And they should have a voice in that process. So community impact assessments, here are just a few examples. Um, that you know, we've heard about light rails being in place and making sure that community members who live in those communities have a voice to play in it. How do we make sure that before the development occurs, you engage people? So again, you know, when we look back in the historical perspective, we know that we all remember, most of us remember urban renewal. Some people may be really young and don't remember that terminology. But urban renewal did a lot to improve communities across the country, but they also destroyed some small businesses. They also put highways in the middle of communities. That, you know, so you have to take a look at how do you weigh, how do you balance you know, the, the impact of these things. And we're not, I'm not saying it wasn't a good thing, I'm just saying that to what degree can we look at the impact in advance and not after the fact. And so this is a piece that we all know that we've got to improve the food environment. And it isn't just about having grocery stores in every community. Every community isn't going to tolerate a grocery store. It might be how to convert the small stores. It could also be about how to, um, how, how to really work with the mom and pop grocery stores, how to make sure that we're having all of these new efforts around urban agriculture and community gardenings, and we hear about farm to school, all of these things. There are different ways that we can improve the health in, of environments. I'm going to be talking about a couple of things that are in place. Uh, in California, this is probably one of the most exciting ones. And you, this is a picture of the first lady coming to the opening of a new grocery store in Los Angeles area. And it was really a wonderful opportunity because it's really showing 
public-private partnerships. Now this was an effort where the California Endowment, which is the largest health funder in California, put $200 million to seed this effort. It is now $264 million through the cooperation of banks, through the Grocers Association, through Kaiser and other hospitals. And what's nice about it is that individuals can buy into it with $20. So this is, a, this is a way in which you have local members being able to build wealth, which is really important in order to change this poverty thing. Um, it's, so it's a very lucrative and exciting way. And many of you, how many people are familiar with the Health Food Financing Initiative? Well, you know, that's a, there's a major effort underway um, that began in Philadelphia a number of years ago. And this was something that was very interesting. This came about as a result of the lack of grocery stores in Philadelphia. Grocery stores were closing all across the country. And so it, it began as an economic development, community development initiative, but it ended up having jobs as because as they opened grocery stores, they hired people from the community. It became a workforce initiative. It was certainly community engagement, and it was also about having the bottom line of health being improved. That was taken to scale to the Obama administration. It began the uh, Healthy Food Financing Initiative in Colorado. It's now one of the leaders. In this, um, in this initiative, and so we congratulate you in your, um, in your um, healthy food financing initiative in Colorado. Uh, now, this Market Creek Plaza in San Diego is also a really lovely story because the Jacobs Family Foundation took a long time to invest in this underdeveloped area of San Diego. And they basically went into the community and asked the community, well, what do you need in order to be healthy, to have a better community? They wanted a grocery store. Now, they chose food for less. That's what they wanted. And so that's what they helped them to build. And this is a way in which they are required to hire community residents who are, who are in the stores. They also have a part of shaping the, the, um, the, the community development efforts, and they're just doing groundbreaking and bringing in a new Walgreen that I just heard about just in the last couple of weeks. So this is a place that is really community driven. The Jacobs Family Foundation had a very interesting philosophy. Their philosophy was that we had heard about the adage of you give a man a fish and he eat for a day, you teach him to fish and he could fish for a lifetime. And they went a step further and said, well, if you fill the pond with fish, they'll always have food to eat. So they take it a, a step further of making sure that people have access to the fish. It's not about just trying to go and find out where they're going to be swimming. So it's a key of really building community capacity to be stronger and to be healthier. So uh, again, I'm just citing a few other examples of really promising practices. Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has funded a really incredible um, partnership of bringing lawyers into community clinics to help their clients with problems because we know that people coming into community clinics, it's not just health issues that they're faced. They're facing with housing issues. They have issues around you know, um, pollution in their environment, toxin in their environment. They don't quite know how to, their legal rights and how to get this stuff addressed. So I thought it was a very creative idea of having lawyers be available for people who couldn't afford to hire a lawyer to assist them with their issues. And another whole series of, ish, of, of examples about having renovations in communities that we have heard about. And the Minnesota Central Quarter is one that was also, the Minnesota, they had agreed to have this light rail, but they had not include community, and they were going to have the rail just bypass a low-income community. The community basically said, no, 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 no. We've got to stop this process and change this around. And through that effort, they now have an, a rail stop that will be in that community that was not a part of the design in the beginning. So this is just an example of how advocacy of having community engaged could really shape and reshape programs and policies. And we've been encouraged to hear, you know, again, about the minimum wage being proposed to be higher as a result of President Obama making that suggestion. Some businesses are choosing on their own to do this without being mandated, and I thought that that's really very encouraging. Now, the study that we read about showed that by raising the federal minimum wage to $10.10, it would raise earnings for 16.5 million workers. Those are the kinds of recovery that we need to see in place. We were also pleased to hear that Walmart was no longer going to be op op uh, oppositional about increasing the minimum wage. So these are things that are happening that we have to, that we have to applaud and we're very happy about. So I'm winding now, and I just want to leave with understanding about 
as we do this great work, how do we assess impact? How do we make sure that we're getting the bang for our buck? How do we make sure that what we're doing is making a difference? And so as we started to look at what we consider ingredients of success, we've done a lot of research about things that are promising that have made a difference. And I have identified a few key features that seem to come up a lot. And the first one is having strong leadership. Having someone at the helm who really is committed for the long haul, who's a visionary, who's bold, risk-taking, think outside the box, you know, willing to, to, to do the work over the long period of time, a commitment across sectors. It's not just one sector that's going to address this issue. It's not going to just be health. It's not going to just be education. It's got to be a broad involvement in order to really make the changes that we're talking about. It's got to be an equity-focused set of strategies. There's got to be creative, compelling use of data. How do we look at the data and see how do we make this data tell a story for us in our communities? How do we build more partnerships with government and community? How, and and this, is a, this is another one around adequate research. You cannot expect to have a major impact by having a two-year commitment with $200,000. It's got to be long-term with adequate funding and those who've stayed in there for like the Jacobs Foundation has been with Market Creek for years. The California Endowment Initiatives that have made a difference have been a 10-year commitment. So being willing to stay for the, over the long haul and um, be able to address all of the challenges that may come in it is really important. And there's got to be continuous review and assessment and make modifications as needed. We have a tool on our website that people should, should be welcome to go and view. It's called GEARS. It stands for Getting Equity Advocacy Results. And basically what it's doing is helping advocacy, people who are doing work, figure out how to do it and how to measure its impact. Everything about how you build your base, how to engage others in your strategy, how to talk about it, how to do your naming and framing of the issues. It's really a very dynamic and interactive tool that you can access on our website and, and learn how to assess equity impact. And this other slide that we're, we have a VP for research that we've been working on trying to figure out what are the indicators for health equity. We've come up so far with these three things that we're continuing to research and to study. One is that we want to measure community conditions. What's happening in a community before and after an intervention? We want to take a look at to what degree have campaigns and strategies and policies made a difference? Can we attribute some difference as a result of these things? And then the last one is about measuring actual health behaviors. So we can't just look at the long-term impact of, we've got, to, we've got to just look at infant mortality. It takes a long time for infant mortality rates to go. It takes a long time for BMI rates to go down. But there are things that we can measure along the way, the interim goals that have to be captured and, and assessed. So as I close, again, we have to make sure that we're creating an equity-focused agenda and one in which everyone can participate and prosper and that we want to make sure that, again, this quote from the, from the Robert Wood Johnson's commission basically is saying that in order for us to become healthier and to reduce the growth of public and private spending on medical care, we must create a seismic shift in how we approach health and the actions that we take. And as a country, we need to expand our focus to address how to stay healthy in the first place. And with that, I thank you so much. And again, I applaud you for the great work that you're doing in Colorado and look forward to having us continue to build a partnership to know that you're not doing this work alone, that you have partners such as Paul Fink. And feel free to call on us. We're here to be there with you. Thank you. So at this point, uh, we'd like to open up for questions for Mildred. Um, I'm going to start because I get to do that. <laughs> Um, so we understand that the investment and the activity needs adequate resources over a significant period of time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> As we engage in this work and get started in working with communities, do you have advice on where the best places, the most important places to start are? Looking across the list of interventions that you had, Understanding that to be successful, we have to address all of them. 
are there some that we really need to prioritize first in moving forward? So I have come to identify three major areas that need to be addressed in order to really make change happen. That is addressing ec the, the education, because we see that educa education is a predictor of life trajectory. Changes that happen must happen in communities. How do we invest in communities to be healthy? And number three, issues around race and culture. The degree to which we're comfortable talking about racial differences that I think many times in this country people think that when you're addressing the racial inequities that you're accusing and pointing fingers and saying somebody is racist. You can talk about racism without accusing someone of being a racist. So how do we have a dialogue in which we can talk openly about issues of race and culture, what needs to change? And then how do we really address the, the, the educational systems and how do we change the community? Those are all three really big things. So you can say even within those things, how do you dissect it a bit further? Uh, because of my work in the Center for Health Equity in Place, I would like to begin with changing the environments. How do we create healthier environments? And those are things that we can begin to do right away. How do we help people have healthier homes? And how do people keep their homes? People have been losing their homes as a result of the, the, the economic um, downturn. Now that we're beginning to build back up, how do we use opportunities that can build the community infrastructure? So those are big things. I don't know if you want me to go deeper into any of those a bit more. Well, I don't want to be selfish, so I'm going to okay. throw the, the okay. questions open to the group and start right here. Sure. I have a question about how to plug in. Um, uh, I'm self-employed, care deeply about these issues, have expertise in community engagement and so forth. Um, I have colleagues who also care about it. We can't um, do our work without some income, mm -hmm. although we, we value volunteerism as well. So I know there are grants, I know there are opportunities. Uh, what do you suggest we, we do to find a way to plug in? Well, uh, thank you for being willing and interested in trying to figure out how to plug in. There is a, way, a, a, a number of ways in which you can serve as an advocate. How, you know, how, how can you, you know, if there is a particular community that you're interested in wanting to make a difference in, how do you find out from them what it is that they need and how you might be able to use your support, your resources to be an advocate for them? You might be able to help to link them to a political leader who could be a champion. You might be able to help to facilitate them meeting someone else that could make a difference. So every single person has a role to play. The key is figuring out what is it that your unique opportunities are, what are your unique, um, what your unique contributions are, and how to link them to those who need them the most. You may have skills around as research. How do you help translate research in a way that people can understand how to make it happen? It could be something as providing transportation to getting to meetings or getting to medical. There's a range of things that people could do in order to make a difference. That's all valuable. Mm -hmm. Question up here. I, want, I have a question about um, an early slide you did relative to your data, and when you were doing some research, you mentioned that there seems to be an appetite for people wanting to have equity in America. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if there's a clear line of sight between that attitude around equity and residential integration, <laughs> housing. Do you so, understand the question so I'm asking? No, I'm not quite sure. So let question. me ask you like this. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about communities and, and, and getting communities work and under-resourced communities, because mm -hmm. low-income communities tend to be under-resourced, mm -hmm. and we know that there are certain residential patterns, housing right. patterns that mm -hmm. exist within the United mm -hmm. States mm -hmm. uh, that can be inclusive as well as exclusive. Mm -hmm. So is there... Um, clear line of sight or was there a deeper investigation of people's mm -hmm. attitudes and how their attitudes show up in terms of housing patterns, where people live, as well as their receptivity to living in diverse communities. Mm, I see. Living, you mm -hmm. know, because 
Mm -hmm. that's, that's one way for us to achieve some mm -hmm. equity and bring resource into communities as well as some of the mm -hmm. other things that you've mentioned. Does that make sense yeah, to I, you Yeah, I understand now? what you're saying. So that was not a question on the survey, to what degree are you willing to live in communities that are more racially diverse? I mean, that's sort of like what you're asking. But what I could say is that even though our countries, many of the, the poor communities tend to be um, seg ra ra racially segregated, you know, with this day and time, the efforts that are underway to make that change happen are happening gradually. And it happens in ways that we hear about when we're tearing down old development and we're building new development. Having a certain percentage of mixed income in the housing, I mean, that, that's a policy that has happened in many places, that before you rebuild anything new in a community, a percentage is going to be a third for low income, a third for middle income, and I don't know what the other third is. People, I'm not quite sure where they may be students or something. But having those kind of policies in place will help to diversify a community, and it creates more interest. I know that in the community where I live, I live in Oakland, California, there's an area of Oakland called West Oakland that has always historically been viewed as being low income and, and low wealth and kind of poverty. That area is changing in such a degree where I see, you know, I drive by now, now and I see white families with kids in their carriage. I mean, I, mean, there are, I visited one friend who her building was renovated and she was the only African American in there. So, and I felt like people are really comfortable living in these areas. I mean, I was, I was kind of surprised. So I think that there are pockets where these things are happening, where people are feeling that they're consciously wanting to live in communities of difference, that they are stronger, that they want their kids to be raised with a broader sense of diversity. And so they're making a conscious decision to do that. But we didn't ask that as a specific question, but I just think that I believe that that shift is occurring, but it's a slowly occurring trend. Maggie, do you have a question from outside of the room? Yep, yeah, this, is, this is from our online audience. As, uh, as population of people of color grows, will people argue that disparities no longer exist? <laughs> How should we combat that thinking? No, that does not mean that disparities no longer exist. It means that, and basically the slides were showing that um, some disparities are so complex and so entrenched that they're very hard to erase. So there is not an association between the changing demographics and the disparities. It just means that, you know, as a whole, the country may be in, in terms of like this obesity study that just recently showed, we have to make sure again that those trends are gonna be impacting those communities that are most in need. So everything has to be reviewed with the lens of, yes, we're happy that these trends are improving, but we wanna make sure that as we go deeper into the analysis of the data that those who are most impacted are not being left out of the equation. Hi, thank you for your, question, for your comments. Mm -hmm. I have a question about measurement. Um, and you put up there some conditions that you are starting to look at around mm -hmm. measurement. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the progress you've made in that area. And then also if there are any communities or programs that you highlighted that you feel have really done some innovative measurement and evaluation around the implementation of these programs and the, condition, the community conditions, and then really linking that to mm -hmm. any behavior change. Yes. There's, there's a tremendous amount of examples of things that are making a difference. Um, in the San Francisco, let me just stop and say that my team is in the middle of, of an intensive study now. We're researching these places across the country that are calling themselves health equity institutes. Many of you might have heard of them. They're Centers for Health Equity, Health Equity Institutes. And so we were interested in seeing what, are these all the same? Are, are, they, are they doing the same work? Are they, they're using the same terminology, but are they doing the same thing? And they're really not. And so we've interviewed a number of people, and we're focusing on public health departments and those that are not, not having public health departments. But within public health departments, we're seeing some tremendous things that are happening, and that's the place public health departments are responsible for measuring these things. And so some of the most progressive things are happening in public health departments. So the Seattle King County Public Health Department has demonstrated how their health equity, and they're putting racial equity at the center of their work, and that they have put in place a number of strategies and programs that are measured by um, addressing health equity that's changing in which and how they're doing their work. In San Francisco, when they were looking at making changes, they were addressing health equity by improving the minimum wage years ago. 
So there's a whole index around community health factors that can be viewed. So I could talk to you offline about some of the places rather than naming them all right now, but Boston Public Health is doing some amazing, I mean, so there are some amazing things where people are making significant changes um, in which they can measure how those changes, but they are long-term measures. They're not gonna be short-term measures. Hi, yes, I, I have uh, noticed that both on your policy link site and the advancement project, you do a lot of work around mapping mm -hmm. and really mapping out community by community, neighborhoods, mm -hmm. what are the different health issues, where are those neighborhood grocery stores, where mm -hmm. are those parks, where are those quality early childhood centers and after school programs. Mm -hmm. And if you could, I wonder if you could talk about that because I think that's something mm -hmm. that um, in Denver and I think across the state is something that we, we haven't made enough of a link between mm -hmm. visually capturing our data mm -hmm. and using it to tell a story. Mm -hmm. Because my experience with policymakers is that words alone simply That's don't right. work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. That's a very good question. And you're absolutely right. They don't want to hear it. They, they don't want to hear any more stories. They, they want to be convinced. You've got it. That's why I was saying compelling use of data is really important. So let me tell you a little bit of, of a story. About 12 years ago, the California Endowment decided that they wanted to do something to address asthma in the state of California. But they didn't know where to, they didn't know what the investment should look like. They didn't know where to invest. And then they, so this is the work that we do at Policy Like We're often behind the scenes doing this work that's considered thought leadership where we're helping them to figure out what, they, what it should be. So we were doing mapping way back then. So we did GIS mapping to see where in the state are asthma rates the highest. So that was one profile. And then, and then okay, and then in those places, which places had the kind of infrastructure to support an investment? Because you just can't put it someplace and they don't have a good program to manage the money. Uh, so where's there, and then where, where are the partners that you could work with? So we help them to define where to invest based on what the mapping showed us. And then we went a step further, and then we were helping them to review the proposals. And then from that, we began to be a TA provider to help those sites create success in their policy change. But it all began with doing that GIS mapping. So uh, the same thing with obesity. When we were doing the Robert Wood Johnson Obesity Center, we wanted to know where are the obesity rates highest. And in all of these things, they tend to be some of the same, com the same communities have the highest obesity, highest unemployment, highest, highest everything. So that's why we believe if you focus on place and you improve the conditions, you could address a number of these diseases. And you don't have to just be disease focused in your approach. If you change the environment to be healthier, you're gonna get better health outcomes that will address diabetes, that will address obesity, that will address all of these things over time. But you can't just use one singular sector approach. Does that help you? I would have to jump in and at least make you aware of a resource that we do have in Denver, the Denver Health Equity Atlas, which was put mm. together by um, uh, Mile High Connects working with RTD. And if you go on the, the, uh, the, if you put in Mile High Connects into your browser, you can get to that. And it's exactly what you're talking about. It's mapping out metro, uh, the metro Denver area and talking about where are the schools, where are the grocery stores, Where's the low, you know, what's the average income of the neighborhoods? What are the low, uh, I'm sorry, affordable housing opportunities? And, and they layer them map after map where you can actually start to look at these areas that, uh, that tell the story about where the problems are. Y you know, what, what we would like to see, and we've talked a little bit about, about the CHI, is how could we get that kind of uh, <coughs> metadata over the entire state because there are unique opportunities and unique challenges for the metro area, but you know Colorado Trust is statewide, and we know that there are lots of health and health equity issues that are across the state. Um, but I, I would make sure that people, it's a fascinating resource. Uh, it's funded through kind of some federal grant, uh, sorry, some national grant activities, and it's available to you now on the internet. Hi, first of all, I just tweeted the um, link to the Regional Equity Atlas, so thanks for mentioning that. That's wonderful. Um, I'm Rebecca Arno. I'm from the Denver Foundation, and I'm, I have a question about um, talking and conversations about race 
in community and how that links to equity. And I wondered if you have any stories or examples of places where community engagement is in advanced by having those conversations about race and that that then links, links to health. That's a very good question. Gee, see, what, what is the first that comes to mind? Um, I could talk about work that we've been engaged with um, nationally through, again, um, the obesity, use, just using the obesity um, crisis as an example. So there were some communities, and, and this is just being very blunt in how some of the issues are viewed and framed. So for example, there was one community that we were in where they were saying, when you're focusing on African American Latino rates being high, are you dismissing poor whites whose rates are also high? And what we're saying is that we're not trying to dismiss the rates of white the, the, the whites where the rates are high, but when we take a look at the whole um, it's just that people of color tend to have worse outcomes. And so how do we make sure that we're including everyone, but we have to concentrate our focus on this population because nationally, that's the pop those are the populations that tend to have the worst health outcomes. And then when we started to talk about how it showed up in terms of how much we spend on health care by not addressing that, by people not having health care, they got it. So what we realize is that if people don't get the... Um, the moral high ground about why you should do it because it's the right thing to do. When you start addressing the fiscal bottom line, people start to get it, oh, that's right, we're spending that much money because people are using the ERs as their primary health care, as opposed to those who tend to have a little bit better health care. So that's just one example of having, you know, you got to use whatever is going to reach people. And it's not about, you know, um, not being authentic. You have to be authentic, but you have to be able to be compassionate in saying we care about everybody. But if you take a look statistically over the data that I've showed you, it's consistently these, there's a pattern of certain populations who tend to have worse outcomes. And so how do we change? Because if those worse health outcomes impact the overall country's health outcomes, because that's a, it's a weight there. No matter how well some people are doing, if, if you look at the country as a whole, you're not going to be rising up if you're going to have those who continue to be bringing it down. So it's like, oh, OK, the light will go off in some of those ways. Thanks Does that help? I have another question from our online audience. You focused on race and ethnicity and also age as variables of inequity. How, what about gender, sexual orientation, immigration status, and other variables? Yes, when we talk about diversity, and, and again, I had to limit, I mean, I was in the or some were surrounded by my papers last night wanted to talk about so much more. And I said, I only have like 30 minutes. I think it went a little bit over. So yes, absolutely. When we're talking about diversity, we've got to address broad sectors. And issues around immigration is a major issue. If we had time to talk about a full set of policy agenda that I would want to recommend, immigration reform is up there with it. Because we've got to take a look at how we're, how we're viewing those of us who are in this country already. The issues around disability, that, I mean, that's a whole issue. The disparities in that population are significant. The disparities among people who are different, whether it's gay, lesbian, transgender, whatever, how, how, how do they feel when they have to go and get health care? How do they feel when, they, when people are not receiving them in a welcoming way? So everybody who's left out has got to be a part of this equation. It's just that for this particular um, agenda, I was narrowing the focus to some degree, but everyone who's not thriving has got to, has, has got to be seen as having value to this conversation. Question over here. Uh, Julie Farrar with the Colorado Developmental Disabilities Council. Uh, oh. It's uh, uh, <laughs> serendipity. Um, I um, wanted to uh, bring up that I am actually a member of one of the largest minority groups in the mm -hmm. country, and we are rapidly growing as the population is aging. And you see the same disparities in people right. of color mm -hmm. um, when you add disability into um, mm -hmm. the equation, like you just 
just mentioned. And one of the things that I think is really important is as we're visioning these sustainable and healthy communities that we take into consideration the ability to age in place. Mm. And so affordable housing is only one piece of it. Mm -hmm. Affordable, adaptable, accessible, and visitable housing, we really, really need to take that into consideration mm -hmm. so that people have the ability to stay in their communities, mm -hmm. stay active in their communities. And, um, and I think that that's one of those systemic issues that still, I, I, I'll admit I was addicted to the Affordable Care Act. I thought it was wonderful, raises, mm -hmm. raises all boats. Mm -hmm. But I feel now that I'm, I, that I'm very actively involved, I, I keep raising my hand and saying, but what about mm -hmm. us? Mm -hmm. Because people with disabilities, nobody wants to join the club. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we're, it's still looked at as a special vulnerable population. Mm -hmm. So instead of building infrastructure for mm -hmm. everyone, and we're, mm -hmm. we're looking still at people with disabilities as a special population. So I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering how we can just bring into the discussion around healthy communities exactly what you just touched on, mm -hmm. that the ability to age in place mm -hmm. is, is, is critical to having healthy communities. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. Um, and I had not heard that term before, being able to age in place. I like that very much. Um, Absolutely. So when we're taking a look at housing, transportation, all of those are factors that have to be in place. I mean, I, I had to go someplace recently and they didn't even have an elevator. And I had to walk up some long steps. I mean, it was uncomfortable for me and I don't have a disability. But I, 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 and I'm always thinking about, well, how do people get around? And I'm thinking about the elderly, you know, how do people adapt? Um, and so we have to be a lot more responsive in this country about how we are viewing this work. And so I will commit to you that I will use this, um, this, this aging in place or, this, uh, or to be more, um, have the visibility a bit more about disability um, in the presentation. Thank you. Hello, I was wondering if you could talk more about the fresh food financing oh. that you briefly mm -hmm. highlighted and mm -hmm. talk about what is happening and why that's so critical. Oh, absolutely, gee, um, that, that's a big story. Yes, that is a very important story because this was something that we talk a lot about taking to scale. The reason, one of the things that our tagline is lifting up what works at Policy Link. And what that means is that our goal is to, there are gyms that are happening across this whole country, but people don't know about them. So how do we lift them up and shed light on them? So there are two things that we did at PolicyLink that really was able to take the skill in a meaningful way. And the fresh food financing was one of them, not we single-handedly, but we had partners with the Food Trust and the Reinvestment Fund to take that idea about look at what's happening. And it began first in Philadelphia. Then it went from Philadelphia to Pennsylvania. So it was a city, then a state, then several of us took that idea to the Obama administration and it now became the National Fresh Fruits um, um, Financing Initiative. And it just recently got authorized in a new farm bill. So that was an evolution that didn't happen before. That is putting grocery stores in low-income communities. It is also assisting those mom-and-pop <laughs> stores. It gives money to, for conversion of those stores. We at PulseLink have created a website devoted expressly around the Healthy Food Financing Initiative. Again, if you go to www.policylink.org and you go to the Healthy Food Portal, you could see that is an amazing tool that you could use. You can get everything you need to know about financing a grocery store, how to get grocery stores in your community, some promising practices where things are happening. So it's an amazing tool that I encourage anybody to utilize. If you want to know anything about fresh food financing, that tool is an amazing place to use. The other thing that we took to scale was people who may have heard of the Harlem Children's Zone and Jeffrey Kennedy's, Jeffrey Kennedy's work. That is an amazing effort that's looking at an educational impact of how do you take kids from cradle to career. That began in Harlem, 100 blocks in Harlem. It's now the promised neighborhood zones that's implemented throughout the country through the Obama administration. So there are things that, that are doing, re doing really good work that need to be brought up to scale and highlighted in a way that we can all benefit them and replicate them. So Katie, I would just add that you probably want to talk to the Colorado Health Foundation because they are the, they've been the lead agency in funding the Colorado Fresh Food Financing Fund low-income loan program that allows uh, neighborhoods, small grocery stores, other groups to apply for a loan 
if, if you're a mom and pop store or fast food place to add like fresh fruits and vegetables in a neighborhood or bring a, 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 a full grocery store into a neighborhood that's a food desert. So they've been actually working on this and are implementing it now. Colorado Trust is a small investor uh, from the standpoint of shared funding. Um, but I think they can tell you a really compelling story. What was fascinating is that because of the work nationally and the big folks that are looking about bringing this to scale, they're actually consultants that can come into a state and tell them how to do this. And uh, so that's exactly what the Health Foundation did. And I think it's a very exciting program. We have another question from our online audience. How can we foster future orientation or hope for our growing Latino population to graduate high school and beyond? And how do we build representative leadership? Okay, so how do we build leadership and success within the Latino population? And the second part of it was? That was the second part. The first was how can we um, foster future orientation for the growing Latino population to graduate high school and yes. beyond, so education and then leadership. Yeah, so I think the first thing is when I was saying to Ned earlier about the education, the education and policies is, is a significant place that has to happen. So the, to what degree first are people aware of educational opportunities? To second to, the second thing is how well are they prepared? How are we looking at education reform in this country so that all schools have the same quality education to prepare, whether they are Latinos, Asians, black, whatever? So there should be an equitable educational system, which is currently not in place. Some communities have stronger educational programs than others. And so how do we have a more equitable array of options available so that people, and then everybody isn't going to go to college. So how do we prepare training and certificate programs? You know, I remember the days of, you know, um, getting the trades. Well, that's coming back again because, you know, it's nothing like when you, like I recently broke something in my house. I had to call a repair person. It's like, you know, $85 for 20 minutes to come in. So there are high paying jobs that don't have to be four year college degrees. So how do we help people understand about training and certificate programs and just provide a range of efforts? There's a lot of efforts underway around really promoting the associate degree program, using community colleges. People who can't afford to go to four-year colleges can go to a community college and get skills and build their, their, their leadership in that way. So there are a number of ways that need, to be, that need to be in place. But we also have to look at the businesses. How do we make sure that businesses will be more open to hiring? people who are different from who they are? How do they see that, that diversity is a good bottom line for your, for your company? That, that businesses thrive when they have a more diverse workforce. You have a broader point of view. You have a more entrepreneurial efforts. You have new ideas, things that you hadn't thought about. So how do we promote the value of diversity as a business bottom line? And those are the ways in which people like Ned can be really very useful because you know, people in leadership who could say, we benefit from having this. It can't just be those of us who, oh, well, she's an advocate. She talks about this all the time. But how do we make sure that others who are not the advocates are saying how we benefit by having a diverse uh, workforce? And it, and it matters. It matters to how we do our work. We all value. We all are better as a result of it. We don't want to just be the same. Am I correct, Ned? Uh, you are correct, yes. yes. <laughs> well, I'm never going to argue with you. <laughs> I think uh, it was a real, uh, a real powerful message at the health department when I was there that there was a real uh, understanding and hiring policies that said our workforce needs to reflect the community that we serve. And that was always a leading issue for CDPHE, and I'm, I'm certain it's true in other departments. I, I wasn't in other departments. Um, but I think you can see the activity, the, the, the uh, improved quality of the services that are provided to a diverse population in more than just the business sector. Mm -hmm. So there's, it's critical for the government sector, it's critical for business, and I would say it's critical for philanthropy. Yes. Oh, what, sorry, we have a... Oh, sorry, one more from the online audience. So, what role do funders have in resourcing data collection and knowledge management to increase awareness of disparities? Well, absolutely, and Ned just gave the, the entry into that. Funders have a tremendous role to play and have played in, in being able to use data in a very creative way. And, and I, you know, I, I say that foundations, philanthropy have a big mandate that they could play. It isn't just about giving money. 
It's about they can use their power as conveners, that they can bring people together to the table to talk about, well, how have you been able to make the change happen in your community? You know, people come when foundations tend to call. You know, so how do they use that as an opportunity? How do they leverage their resources in such a way? How do they make sure that when they're writing their grant proposals, they can put language that mandate a certain percentage it must, uh, you know, you must have a certain percentage of involvement and participation. You have to measure it in such a way. So there are a number of ways that foundations can be viewed as partners beyond the traditional just giving money out. Maybe a last question here. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, thanks so much for your comments today. Um, I was just curious about um, urban versus rural. A lot of Colorado mm. is very rural in small mm -hmm. communities. Um, and how just some of these key indicators and key mm -hmm. areas that you mentioned and the research that's being done, mm -hmm. um, is any of it being done in uh, rural locations? And would you say that the indicators um, or the steps to take in building health equity are the same or similar mm -hmm. in urban versus rural? Excellent question. And thank you for, for letting me know that I didn't talk about the rural piece, and I often do mention that, because you can't, it can't be one size fits all. It can't be one cookie cutter approach to this. And we do take a look at what are the unique needs in rural communities, um, and how do we make sure that we're addressing that need. And I can just tell you a little brief story. Um, in, in California, people tend to view California as being very progressive, but California has some of the most, um, some of the poorest communities, and one of the most embarrassingly poor community is a rural area in the Central Valley where the majority of the food that we eat in this country is grown. Uh, and that, that community doesn't have safe water. They've got to pay money every month to have water because their water is not good. So we're doing work around building the infrastructure. We're passing policies to make change happen to address those particular things. So all of these strategies, when we talk about housing and food, have to be uniquely applied to rural areas that it's not gonna just be a grocery store in a rural area. It may be, how do we have farmers markets? How do we create a better partnership between the farmers markets and the schools? Because that's been one thing that has happened in one of our communities as well, that in these rural areas, they have brought their food and that the schools are using to feed children. So how do we create those linkages better? So I totally agree that we have to look at the unique um, features and communities that I, are rural. I think as the, as the trust gears up on community engagement and community-based participatory grant making. <clears throat> One of the ideas is that we can't sit here in Denver and design a strategy or solution that's gonna work in rural Colorado. Right. So, mm -hmm. okay, we got that message, we mm -hmm. understand. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the issue is to really go to the community mm -hmm. that knows itself, knows right. its problems, can identify the solutions that a community can own. So we're looking for those authentic partnerships as we move forward in grant making uh, for exactly that reason. I would mm -hmm. say the same is true if I get just for in in terms of a large metro area like Denver, because the neighborhoods are diverse and different mm -hmm. and have their own unique uh, strategies, issues to face, and solutions, and so mm -hmm. that's where that kind of authentic partnership with community comes mm -hmm. from as we try to roll our work out going forward. Um, so uh, I'm I'm curious as to whether or not you've looked at we've talked about poverty and the and the effects of poverty, but. Uh, as families move out of poverty, say, into the lower middle class, whether you've looked at the question of the intergenerational transfer of wealth mm. and the policies that um, prevent people from transferring wealth, one of the things we've always been interested in is, for example, the Medicaid requirement that people sort of, you know, the, the look back provisions and those things that require people to give up their homes mm. um, if they need long-term care at the end of life. That's one example. But if you can't secure your foothold in the in the lower middle class, mm. and by passing on your home or your assets to your children, then you don't, you don't have intergenerational progress. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious as to whether or not you've looked at that issue. Well, there's a whole unit at PulseLink that I'm not a part of that. It's an asset building team. They're doing this exact same thing. So they're, and, and, and again, if you go to our website, you could research asset building strategies. There is a tremendous array of strategies that they have in place, everything from stopping the predatory lending in these communities communities to looking at other ways of building wealth because in our country home ownership has been the pathway to wealth building but we know a few years ago people lost their homes and so they lost that option so that there are some new ways that things are happening but I'm not the best person to try to identify them but they are I would encourage you to 
um, to, or, or at the end, I could give you the person who, who you could speak to in our office around asset building. But that is key to wealth building. Hi, Sam Mario from Family Voices Colorado. It's mm -hmm. a quick question about, you know, you're talking about framework and messaging and, mm -hmm. and meaningful stakeholder engagement in communities. Mm -hmm. How does the community go about um, impacting institutional biases mm -hmm. as it relates to um, a system towards a community in um, uh, appropriate and tactful ways to work with the community? Because hmm. there is an institutional bias component to many of the things that we're talking about. So that's a, that's, that's a tough one, because there's got to be a sense that their institutions and their policies in those institutions impact the environments in which they're located. And that is why there's, you know, we've heard of um, the hospitals having community <laughs> benefits that they have to give a certain amount of resources and supports. It's that same basic idea that whatever community that you're located in, it's up to you and your, and your sense of, of, of being a good business person to support that community that, that you're living in. So to what degree that, that institution is, can be challenged to see the value and having community have a voice. And if they don't see that as a value, then I don't know what it's gonna take. It's gonna take people helping them to see that, you know, we don't always wanna advocate for it being some kind of harsh, you know, getting people out of the community. But those things have happened where when communities, when institutions have not been responsive, communities take up against them and they don't tend to do well. And so they have to, not that they have to, it would be in their best interest to figure out a way to see community as partners with them. If they could see that there's value, that there's contribution, that, it's, it, that it helps their bottom line to have the community view them as being a member of this community-centered work that they're doing. So Mildred, we're, we're about out of time. I have a few final comments, mm -hmm. but I, I wanted to give you at least the opportunity for, for what you would like to leave us with today. Well, um, very engaging, good questions. They kept me on my toes there. Um, well, I'm encouraged by the questions because they show deep reflections. And what I would, what I would like to suggest that is for, there wasn't enough time to go really in depth with some of the maps that I shared with you. That there could, maybe there could be a way that groups could talk among themselves and really look at the maps and to see in my area, this is what the trend appears to be. What does this mean for my community? Do we have the kind of programs and policies in place that's gonna help this next generation? As the baby boomers are beginning to retire, remember, there's gonna be young people to, help to come along and take our jobs. Do we want to make sure that they are going to be doing a good job with that? How, how do we make sure that in our community, what you are invested in in your community, how do you look at it differently? How do you really go in there and look at the data and to see what other data need to be um, looked at? And how do you make a change in your approach to your work in these arenas as a result of what the data is sharing with you? That would be my my suggestion is that we really take the time to have small groups having conversations about the data, about the racial issues, about the cultural issues, and what could we, do, what we, everybody has contribution. What could be our individual comfort? Me as an individual, me as a coworker where I'm working, me in my community where I live, me in my sorority, my fraternity, me and whatever role that I play, how can I be a bridge to making change happen? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you Jeff. I think people in the room know that Colorado Trust has a long-standing commitment to all Coloradans, but particularly to those families and individuals who are most vulnerable. We understand we have a great role to play in, in uh, lending a helping hand to those who are most in need and strengthen their ability to make healthy choices. We also believe, as you've heard, engaging communities is a key piece to achieving health equity. It's our intent to authentically partner with communities so that we can increase opportunities for all Coloradans to make those healthy choices and lead productive lives. I want to point out that the slides for today's uh, talk presentation are available on our website, coloradotrust.org, 
And then we need to do some processing and we'll uh, post a live uh, re uh, recording of the event uh, in the next couple of weeks. <clears throat> Visit our website to learn about the rest of the 2014 and upcoming events. The next event will be here again at the History Colorado Center on May 8th with Dr. Manuel Pastor, oh, Pastor from the University of Southern California. So you've heard about him. We've, we've got a great introduction and we'll get to see him coming up. Please uh, uh, f take a couple of minutes to fill out the brief survey. It helps uh, uh, us think about how we can make these more effective. And then I always have to thank some folks. This is always a team effort. I just get to stand up and I don't even have to write my own words. Uh, it's a fantastic job, what can I say? Uh, I want to thank specifically Par uh, Patricia Martinez, Alicia Bo Elisa Bourne, she's going to kill me, Elisa Bourne, Tara Spar, and the rest of my, the Colorado Trust staff for the execution of these events. I also want to thank the staff of the Colorado, the History Colorado Center. Then um, we couldn't do this without the hard work of our Health Equity Learning Series team, Chris Armijo, Courtney Ricci, and Maggie Frazier. Thanks to all of you, and thanks for joining us. I hope you have some learnings that you can take away in your own settings, and I look forward to seeing you in the future. Thanks very much. Thank you.